Good to see you this morning as we worship together. It's a beautiful day, isn't it? <laughs> as we uh, do worship, let me remind you that we are continuing our wearing masks because we love each other and staying at home because we love each other also if we have symptoms. Um, that being said, let me let me share with you something that uh, I was going to share with the children. So you are my children's sermon this morning, all right? Um, how many of you know that Saturn and Jupiter are going to align this coming uh, tomorrow, actually? Uh, you may have read it. I, uh, I just tell you what, I, I am uh, just thrilled to have thought uh, or to have seen this. It hasn't happened in almost 800 years that uh, the two planets will be that closely aligned, and if you don't know what we're talking about, tomorrow evening at about five o'clock, and this is going to continue probably for about a week, um, each evening around five o'clock or just a little bit after, just after it begins to get dark, you'll be able to see in the southwest sky the what looks like a Christmas star. It, uh, and some speculate that this is the very kind of uh, phenomenon that guided the wise men from the east. and um, But there is one other speculation that I read also about this, that there was a triple alignment. There was another, not a planet, but another body that was involved in it at the time of Jesus' birth. And so it would have been a triple star kind of arrangement. And uh, thinking that the wise men came from the east toward the west, we are we are looking into the southwest. This is uh, now you can make a case for a lot of stuff like numerology and everything else in the Bible. But uh, what I'm going to encourage you to do, <clears throat> and I know we're going to be doing, is we're going to be reading Matthew chapter two, verses one through eleven uh, during this coming week. And uh, you might want to jot those down if you want some more information on it. I printed out a few of these copies. I was going to give to the children, tell them that they had to grab their parents by the ear and do this every every night this coming week. My thought is that I'm going to be sitting and I'm going to be looking into the Southwest and I'm going to look at this phenomenon and I'm going to read this scripture. And I really think that, I mean, just thinking about the act of doing that, I can see that uh, it's going to be a beautiful week leading up to Christmas Day. And I'm thanking God already for it because sometimes the visual just absolutely helps us to, uh, to understand some of God's great creation and what he has done for us. Father God, your entire creation announces your splendor and your glory. We pray that in this time of worship that you would receive the reflection of that back from us as best we possibly can to a God who is more than worthy of every bit of praise that we could offer throughout our entire life. We lift this prayer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. In those days, a decree went out from the Imperial Augustus that all the world should be registered. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went to the town of Nazareth to Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. Today we remember Joseph, worn out traveler and worried husband, doing what was necessary for the sake of the family, the burden of poverty stifling his hope in the promise of God. There was no room for him, yet he knows to whom he belongs. Today we give thanks for the Josephs among us, Migrating far from the home where there is no choice, fiercely devoted to the ones they love, and wavering in their belief that there is room for all the kingdom of God. On this fourth Sunday of Advent, we light this candle as a symbol of Joseph, who knocks at the door, ready to take his place among royalty.
for Mary and Joseph. Last week we looked at Mary, and this week we're going to look at Joseph. Uh, Mary and Joseph had been faithful to each other. They waited for marriage, and they both got a visit from the Christmas angel with the news that Mary was expecting. And that was the last thing in the world that either one of them expected. This was the stress of the highest order. And when the angel said to Mary, the shadow of the Almighty will come across you and you will be with child, Mary said to the angel, how can this be? How can this be? The whole stress thing, the whole stress mania, if you will, is kind of out of hand. Uh, a number of generations ago, I think back in the 40s, maybe even the 30s, uh, Norman Vincent Peale once said that people are so stressed out these days, they can't even fall asleep in church. Well, every year I struggle with that as well. Not me sleeping, you sleeping. Right? Um, actually, sensing though, that the stress of holiday survival is somehow going to do me in. That's what I really struggle with. I think of all the stressful things that can happen. And I sense that you also have that. Too much going on, too little time. Hurrying, busy, stressed. Every year, Elizabeth and I vow that we're not going to get caught up again. And every year, I wind up eating my words, along with too much Christmas turkey and Christmas junk food. This year... Added some new wrinkles to the repertoire, didn't it? We had COVID-19 this year, the gift that keeps on taking. It takes away even looking at you and seeing your face. It takes away uh, perhaps the health of a loved one. It takes away our loved one perhaps from us altogether. I don't think that there is a person in this auditorium right now that isn't aware of a friend or an acquaintance at least who got COVID. And um, so this is, a, this is a tremendously stressful year that we have just been through. Like Debbie said, it's been a tough year. It's been more than tough, it's stressful. Uh, pastors have had to learn how to be movie producers to pro provide worship for congregations. 400,000 other stress builders. And with all the stress in our current day society, it's a wonder that things can move along. You know, tomorrow the stock market will open. Tomorrow people will go to work. Tomorrow there will be some gatherings here, there, and everywhere, a little bit further apart, but there will be. And so it's difficult to maintain a kind demeanor. I think about one situation in particular, there was a luggage handler who was checking in bags at the, at the, um, uh, the entranceway to the airport. And this guy brought his luggage up, and he was critical of the way the luggage handled, handled everything. He criticized him for several minutes. He just belittled the young man, and he criticized every move that he made. Surprisingly, the young man who was the porter, the baggage handler, he didn't seem troubled by this man's verbal abuse at all. And after the guy went into the airport, another person came to bring his luggage in. He said, I saw what happened, man. I don't know how you put up with that guy. He's such a jerk. And the guy looked at him, the young porter said to him, you know, it's really not a problem. It's not a big thing. I mean, that guy's getting on a plane to go to New York, and his bags are on the way to Brazil right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't ever want to entrust my bags to that guy. <laughs> the question, considering all this stress and all the difficulty that we have seen and known this year, the question I want to ask, out loud, right here in the church of all places, and it begs to be addressed, is Christmas the problem? I know people, even committed Bible-believing Christians, who say they hate Christmas. Hate Christmas. Now, I know they don't mean the coming of Christ. I know that they're talking about the media Christmas glitz. I know they're talking about meaningless hurry. And I know they're talking about debt-creating overspending. We all get trapped in that at points. However, the fact is, the question, if it is going to be asked at all, raises the possibility that Christmas is the problem. Not God's incredible priceless gift of a Savior, 
That's not the problem. It's the way we go about celebrating Christmas. John Grisham wrote a book that was also later made into a movie entitled Skipping Christmas. It's about a husband and wife who decide that they're not going to participate this year. Uh, they brought, they bought $6,000 worth of gifts the previous year, and this year with the daughter going off to college, they're just not going to do it again. They're not even going to decorate a tree. So what do they do? They spend $3,000 on a cruise instead. Stress is a motivator. And this morning, I want to offer as a thesis for us to chew on for these last days of Advent that stress really is a, a, a motivator. It's something that causes us to do some things we would not do if the stress were not there. And the thesis will go something like this. Part one of a two-part thesis is, yes, Virginia, Christmas is the problem of our stress. Part number two of the thesis is, yes, Virginia, Christmas is also the only solution for Christmas stress. You ask the question here, how can something be the problem and the solution? That's a little like my doctor saying, Brownworth, you're 40 pounds overweight, you need to stock up on Snickers bars. <laughs> that kind of thinking just doesn't work. It doesn't compute, does it? So let's look at what does compute. Let's look at what really does work. Let's look at the example of Joseph, a man for whom Christmas stress should be, I mean, he could have been the poster boy of stress. Joseph is the picture of how to take care of Christmas stress. A few things about Joseph. Joseph, first of all, was heartbroken with the circumstances. Joseph was preparing for marriage. He was preparing for life with the love of his life, Mary. Mary was a beautiful young woman. Joseph was working hard at building a career. And betrothal in those days was marriage, legally. Only the bride and the groom did not come to live together yet. That's quite different, isn't it, from today's day and age when couples live together without ever even thinking about getting married. Well, Mary became pregnant. Now, this had to have shattered Joseph's hopes and dreams for a respectable life. I mean, in that culture, there were serious consequences for this kind of a situation. It had to have crushed his heart because it says that Joseph loved Mary. Well, Christmas stress indeed. Joseph came to the first Christmas without any tinsel, no twinkling lights. He didn't even have a fruitcake. He only had heartbreak. But not only was he heartbroken, Joseph was humiliated. The Bible tells us that Joseph has to plan to divorce Mary privately. Now that key word is privately. Why? Because he knew that if it wasn't if it wasn't a thing that he kept under the radar, that everybody, I mean the snide remarks, the social snubbing, Joseph wanted to spare Mary of all of that. But the worst case scenario was if the leaders of the community found out about it, Mary could have been stoned to death. Well, it would seem a strange thing these days that a couple should be expected to get to know each other before marriage, <laughs> to get engaged after a serious time of counseling with a pastor or a Christian counselor about marriage and about their relationship and seeing if they were fit for each other. The engagement should be more than 20 minutes. The engagement should last through a period of time to where the couple really gets to know each other. And waiting, lest it not be said, waiting to after marriage before entering the world of being one physically. Well, however antiquated these notions might be to today's culture, that practice alone would cut the divorce rate by 75% if it were followed. Get to know one another, wait, see God's face, worship together, make a covenant that divorce is not a word we will, in, we will encounter at all. We will not entertain that word for our marriage. Um, it's, it's been said often enough in our household, murder, yes, divorce, no. 
Joseph understood God's way is one man, one woman, one lifetime. His humiliation for himself and for Mary was in God's eyes as well as in everyone who knew them. Elizabeth and I knew something, know something about this kind of a, of a thought because we were married in 1967. And I had been inducted into the army five months prior, kind of one, two, three, four, five months before I left for the service. And we had made this decision to get married if I got orders for overseas. Well, we didn't share that with anybody except our parents. When the orders came, I called and I told Elizabeth I had my leave coming up. We had nine days. And so we met with the minister of United Methodist Church there in Smithtown, New York. And Reverend Bardsley agreed to marry us, and three days later, we had a wedding. And uh, I'm certain that some of our friends and, wedding and relatives at that wedding were doing the math for the next several months as to what made this uh, hurry-up wedding take place. Well, I need to show you the birth certificate. Uh, I would do that because our first daughter, our first child, Jennifer, was born four years and three months after the wedding. She was born in 1971. So there. Joseph couldn't quite say that. Good. Joseph was heartbroken, he was humiliated, but Joseph was also a hunted person. He was sticking with Mary and it brought danger into the equation. Mary had several liabilities, as we've mentioned. First of all, she could have been a convicted adulteress, which would have meant she could have been stoned under Jewish law. If the town elders had gotten wind of it and had seen so fit, they could have taken her to the edge of town and put her off by herself, and everyone would have gathered around her, picked up rocks, we're not talking about pebbles, rocks, and thrown them at her until she lay in a crumpled, bloody mess, dying. Well, they... Uh, she also claimed to be pregnant, and God did it. Now, the Pharisees would have had a field day with that one. That's what the angels said to Mary, that the shadow of God would come over her, and she would become pregnant. As a matter of fact, they hung Jesus on a cross for that same charge of blasphemy. Mary could have gotten the death penalty just like Jesus did, because they... Mary claimed that God was the one who was responsible for the pregnancy. Jesus said that he was the son of God. And so they were claiming things that according to the elders of that day were blasphemy. So take your pick, adultery, blasphemy. But what else was Joseph hunted about? Well, Joseph had to take his little family and up and go away from Bethlehem, uh, from Jerusalem, and take his family to Egypt to escape the Holocaust that Herod the king was going to bring. They still call it the slaughter of the innocents. Uh, when the wise men came, followed the star, like we're all going to do tomorrow night, just after 5 o'clock, reading Matthew 2, verses 1 through 11. And uh, they followed the star, and they uh, wound up in a meeting with the king Herod. And they talked to him about the prophecy where a king would be born under that star. <clears throat> And so what did Herod do? He got paranoid, and he decided that, well, all children under the age of two had to die. And he sent his soldiers out, and every male child was killed in that region. But Joseph had been warned by another visit from an angel, and he took his family to Egypt to escape that slaughter. Sticking by his vows was a costly experience for Joseph. The first Christmas was stressful for Joseph. He was heartbroken, humiliated, and hunted. It was a financial disaster. It was emotionally draining and spiritually taxing. He was picturing, Joseph was, a wife, kids, dog, a white picket fence kind of a life. What he got was overtaxed, shamed, confused, and run out of town. So, is there any stress connected with this first Christmas? I would say it was life-changing stress. It's easy to second-guess God at this point. I mean, have you ever had this thought, wouldn't it have been so much simpler if God had brought the Messiah into the world after Mary and Joseph were married? 
and nobody would have known. They would have been quite respectable, thank you, pillar of the community. Joseph's business would have thrived. Didn't that make more sense? I'm certain Joseph had that very thought many times over the years. God, why? Why did you do it that way? God, why didn't you do it this way? God, why is my life so difficult? Lord, why am I so stressed out? On this side of history, you and I can point to the prophecies of a virgin giving birth and the flight to Egypt, but with Joseph, all this happened so quickly. It's easy to get like a Monday, Monday morning quarterback and judge the situation, what happened there. What was God up to? Where was this all going? Several years ago, I heard the illustration of how that would seem in a setting today, an actual setting. Uh, go back with me 19 years ago to September the 10th, 2001. You remember where you were on that day? That was the day before, 9-11-2001. Remember? 9-11. Remember what happened that day? Go back to the day before that. Just suppose, this is what the speaker said about this. Just suppose on September 10th, 2001, President Bush had closed all of the airports, forbidding anybody to fly for the next week. It is a certainty that the ACLU, People for the American Way, constitutionalists, congressmen, senators, and every half the country would have been clamoring for impeachment. What do you mean? Shutting down the airports. You realize how expensive, inconvenient. And why would be why would they be so upset? Because they did not know the future. They didn't know that the next day 5,000 people would die at the hands of terrorists who got a hold of four airplanes. If they had only known what the president knew, they would put him up for sainthood. Not impeachment, right? In the same way that Joseph didn't know what was in God's heart at that first Christmas, you and I do not know what's in God's heart for us this Christmas. We have no idea. Who can understand the ways of God? Who can understand the heart of God? <clears throat> it caused stress for Joseph to follow God's instructions, and we are no different than he is. Following Christ causes stress. The world did not understand then, and they little understand now. Christmas is a source for our stress. But more importantly, Christmas is also the only solution for our stress. So you ask, how can Christmas be the solution when Christmas is the problem? Well, consider Joseph one more time. Joseph's mercy brought some insight to him that we need to have in our lives as well. Here's how this played out. Joseph had settled on this plan to privately divorce Mary before the angel arrived. Before the angel arrived. I believe it was this act of mercy which included Joseph in God's plan. Joseph was attempting to spare Mary the adultery charge, the humiliation, and all the snide remarks of the community. And I believe that this is why the angel appeared to Joseph and explained God's heart in the matter. Is there, any, is there any doubt that this is the only explanation for why Joseph was obedient? I also believe that we would see a whole lot more insight, a whole lot more of the move of God's Spirit in our lives if we were as inclined to mercy as Joseph. You know, sometimes, and I think even in the family of God, I think in church people, we can be the most unforgiving when we see something go wrong in somebody else's life, a bad choice they made, a series of bad choices they made, and we can be so unforgiving at times. But Joseph, Joseph, a man whose life was on the upswing, and suddenly Mary drops the bomb on him, I'm pregnant, and God did it. And Joseph immediately thinks, yeah, right. Look what you have done to my life. That had to be the first thoughts. Sometimes we all have a little clue of the purpose of God in our lives. And so we fight the stress of the situation instead of hunt for God's purpose in the situation. We become our own worst enemy. 
But Joseph was given some insight, some understanding what was really going on, some understanding of God's purpose for his trials and his joys and what he could have expected. And it's the key, that is, to having the peace over what's happening. If instead of being unforgiving and fighting the stress that we face, we can learn to be forgiving and try to understand God's purposes for our trials and our joys, we can have the key to peace over what's happening. Bad stuff, when it happens, annoys us. Anybody ever pleased when bad stuff happens? I'm not. Bad stuff annoys us, but good stuff, the good things that come into our life, if it's not connected to some real higher purpose, it simply makes us too busy. It crowds out our lives. You know, I've received invitations to go here, there, and everywhere at Christmas time. We have to we have to pick. We have to choose and pick. Why? It's because if we're so busy that we can't sit at five o'clock tomorrow evening reading Matthew chapter two verses one through eleven while gazing at that double appearance of the Christmas star. We're going to miss so much. Understanding God's purposes is the light that dispels the darkness that tries to envelop us. Mercy, personal mercy towards those around us, it's the key that unlocks that door. Joseph's mercy brought some insight, but it also brought something else to him. It brought great blessing. The insight made blessing possible because he knew that God was going to bless his life in some way. God's word says that Joseph stuck, stuck it out with Mary. He took all of the humili humiliation, all of the being hunted, the heartbreak. He took all of the risks and he hung in there with her all of the way. What did Joseph do? He raised Jesus as his own. He taught him the carpenter trade. He named him Jesus, which in Aramaic is Yeshua, or God saves, and he protected him. And Joseph braved all of that first Christmas stress with all of its difficulty. And in his life, in Joseph's life, it meant raising the savior of the entire human race right in his own home. Had he not been forgiving, I doubt very seriously the Christmas angel would ever have visited him in the first place. And he never would have known God's purposes. But it meant seeing the salvation of the world standing there in the temple a dozen years later teaching the teachers. It meant being right up close day after day to the sinless perfection of Emmanuel, God with us. It meant a godly household in every deepest, truest sense of the word. Can you call that a blessing? Can you call that joy? Can we call that the solution for stress? Instead of getting stressed out, get mercy out and watch God bless. There's an epilogue to this story. In this life, Joseph never saw Jesus' earthly ministry. Evidently, Joseph died early according to church tradition. We don't hear about Joseph's past when Jesus was 12 years old in that temple incident where he was teaching the teachers. And some folks would evaluate that as being rather short-changed. Poor Joseph. Joseph went through all the stress of that first Christmas, put up with public humiliation, heartbreak, being hunted, and all he got out of it was an early grave. That doesn't sound like a blessing, does it? I mean, that might play out if you're into judging on what you can see, but isn't that the opposite of faith? By faith, Joseph trusted God. He was merciful to Mary, and he obeyed God's leading. Now, he never saw the blessing work out in his life, and some would say that's not fair, but it depends on your perspective. Do you think it would have been a fair thing, a blessing thing, for Joseph to have lived long enough to see Jesus hanging on the cross like Mary had to? Either way, we can't second-guess God over why Joseph died young, but we can see the parallels in our own life about stress, and the way we have acted, if we've acted badly and we just got angry, we fought against the stress. What bad things further happened? How much did we feel outside of the knowledge of whatever God's purpose is? But in times when instead of fighting against the stress, we accepted the stress 
as part of a cross to bear, perhaps, and somehow you got an inkling of a blessing that God was going to bring because of it. That's the difference between Joseph and some of us. I saw firsthand one of those blessings 18 years ago in a circumstance that I thought was rather stressful and worked something like this. The church that I was serving had done a marvelous job of, prevent, of presenting the gospel to the community. It was kind of a free theater thing. Uh, we, we called it Walk Through Bethlehem. We built a city of Bethlehem, and we talked about doing that here one time. Uh, but in this particular church, we, we built the city of Bethlehem, and we invited everybody to walk through. We invited our community in to walk through and meet the citizens who were our church members dressed in first century costume. And each one of them, each one of our church members who were in costume was ready to connect the dots for visitors about the miracle of the birth of Jesus. It was a great plan, it worked well. We had about 1,100 people that walked through in the two nights that we had that presentation. One of the visitors called me uh, the next day after she came. She, uh, she lives in High Point, or lived in High Point at the time, I don't know if she's still there or not. Her name was Amanda, Amanda uh, Gramelay, who is a member of Victorious Life Church in High Point, independent kind of church. She was impressed and she wanted to know more about it. We had about an hour's worth of conversation on the phone. She wanted to know, you know, uh, how did we get all the information about what they did in those days and where did it come from? Where did you get the costumes? How did you, you know, you know advertise? How did you get people to come there? This, that, and the other. She wanted to know everything. I told her everything that I knew. And I asked her why she wanted to know all this stuff. And she said that she'd been moved by the Holy Spirit to propose to her pastor that they do that. She said, we need that thing in high point. And that church took what we did in Thomasville with Walk Through Bethlehem. They took it to new heights. They went all out. I, I wish I could show you the picture. I wish we had the screen operating right now. I'll show you the picture. It's in, it was in the High Point Enterprise. If you look at the sermon tomorrow on, on YouTube, you'll, you'll, you can see that picture because I'll put it up there. They built a city that was just about to scale. I mean, it was just absolutely beautiful. It was humongous. And then in the picture that was in the High Point uh, Enterprise, you can see Amanda in the, in the foreground and in the background, the city with towers and huge gates and cross in the background and all that. And it's just absolutely fantastic what they did. It was a tremendous success in High Point that following year in drawing in the community and leading people to Christ. Now, that's the purpose of everything that we should do in any church, to lead people to Christ. Those who already know Christ, lead them deeper into fellowship with Christ. Those who don't know Christ, lead them to fellowship with Christ and salvation. Now, that was the sweet part. That was the blessing. There was a bit of sourness for me because our church didn't get to do it the second year. We had to cancel for a number of various reasons. And so the question that I have is much like the question that Joseph must have had over and over again. Why? Why did our event get cut short? And why did they get to succeed and we didn't? I honestly don't know. To this day, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. But I'll tell you how I came to terms with all of it. We gave birth to that idea and we went forward with it to honor the Lord. And perhaps because we were faithful in what we did, it did honor our Lord. Our church gave their best that year. And for me, that removed the stress from Christmas, the fact that we gave our best for Jesus. It answers the question, how can it be? Or why? Or any of those other questions that you have for God when the stress begins to come over you. It does that. It answers the question. And I answer the question, why or how can it be? With this sense, it can be whatever he desires it to be. No matter what's happening in your life right now, you can use that sentence to take the stress right out of it.
here's a bit of a challenge for you. This year's activities, as curtailed as they might be by social distancing, try to give God glory for every sweet heart that comes your way. But if there are some of those things of a Joseph kind of a question, why, why me, why now, why this way, couldn't you figure out something else, God? Give God just a little bit of room to work in you and your friends and family and even your enemies. You never know. You may be asking the question, how can this be? What you need to have is the answer. It can be whatever he desires it to be. His arm is not shortened. Let's pray together. Father, our hearts are glad and always by the approach of the Savior. Help us, Lord, to dial back the stress with an extra measure of faithful joy this year. Help us to focus on the reality that this isn't about the gifts, it's not about the parties, it's not about managing stress. This is about the love of God entering our life and making all things eternally right. For the glory and honor and praise to which you alone are worthy, O Lord, we pray in the name of the Son, cooperating with the Spirit, to honor and exalt the majesty of the Father. Let it be so in each of our lives, we pray. Amen. In the same hymn, then we're going to come back and complete our Advent wreath. We're going to light the Christ candle. After we sing angels from the realms of glory. <laughs>
We stand together for benediction. Go in grace, go in peace, go in the mercy and fellowship of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be merciful. Stress doesn't have a chance against mercy. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed Christmas. Amen. Amen.